Hi, everybody. My name is Danica Joan, and welcome to another week of Custody Matters Live. Today, my guest is Dana Liquid. Oh, I'm going to mess Liquidera. it up. <laughs> Dana, Dana Liquidera. I should have had you say it. <laughs> Laquidera. That was close. Laquidera. All right, I got it. Dana Laquidera. <laughs> Anyways, Dana is a writer. And she actually is an adult child of parental alienation. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. She also has a memoir out uh, that she's working on that's called Alienated, and it's a daughter's memoir. So welcome, Dana. Thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. So uh, tell me, I know um, we all come from different walks of life and, and how we end up in this advocacy work. So can give us a little background of, of uh, how you ended up doing um, becoming a writer that, that shares, uh, shares yeah. awareness? Well, I was alienated from my mother when I was four years old. And um, I was also alienated from my maternal extended family. And I really, um, other than a brief period of visitation with my mother, I did not see her again until I was a teenager. And that was just a, a single visit. And then after that, um, I saw her, I looked her up when I was in my mid twenties, after I had become a mother myself. And at that time, I listened to her whole story. I wanted to hear, you know, her side of the story, what had happened. And that's when I really um, started figuring out what alienation was. And I didn't have the word for it. I, it. And I actually still thought it only had happened to me. I didn't know anyone else that had been alienated from a parent, who, you know, from a parent who was still very much alive. And um, so even at that point, after seeing my mother again and hearing her story and realizing what had happened, um, it, it took me a long time after that to, to truly come to terms with it, to try to speak with my father about it, um, and then eventually to start blogging about it because I, you know, I've always loved writing and it was always easier to write about this than to speak about it mm. uh, for a long time. So I started a blog and then um, got messages from so many alienated parents who were asking me, you know, saying that I'm in the position of being alienated from my child or my adult child or teen child, what, what can I do? What can I say? And I was just overwhelmed with the number of families that go through this. Um, I just, you know, I couldn't believe it. And that's when I really started feeling almost a responsibility to tell my story just to spread awareness. Um, and, and, you know, it was kind of scary at first. I mean, the first time I ever told my story of what happened to me was in therapy in, in my 20s. And, you know, it, I had this awful panicky feeling like I'm not supposed to be talking about this. So it, it took me a long, long time to really be able to talk about it. And, and I like to, um, you know, I don't want to just share the pain of it. I, I, I hope to be sharing the wisdom of, you know, what, what I've learned from it, things that might help other people, whether they be alienated parents or um, alienated children, which are harder to reach for sure. Yeah, you know, this is, this is really huge because I know all um, those of us have been a targeted parent uh, we have, and of course, we've lost our child, like the chances while the child was a child. Mm -hmm. um, I think part of it is we're looking for hope. They're, we're looking for the light at the end of the tunnel that maybe we, we, uh, we got robbed from, our, from a relationship with our child as a child, but mm -hmm. that maybe there's hope. And, um, and that's, and I'm, what I'm noticing is that there's more and more adult children of alienation they're speaking up and um and i know it makes a difference what you're yeah. doing is making a difference so your your memoir you've um it it is tell us a little bit about your memoir tell us a little bit about like who raised you and um sure. just take us down that process 
Okay. Uh, my mem memoir is not out yet. I'm, I'm editing it now, and it took me a long time to write. You know, I first had to sort of give myself permission to write my story and, and be convinced that it was okay to tell this story because growing up, it, it was this um, really kind of a deep, dark secret that I felt forced to keep. Um, about a year after my parents divorced, my father remarried and I was told to call his new wife, mom. Uh, and I did, for, you know, from from then on, and we essentially lived as if my actual, my real mother never existed. I mean, she was completely erased from my life, and I didn't have access to any of the people who would talk about her, you know, in a positive light. It wasn't until well into adulthood that I could reach out to um well, to her and to her family, but also to my father's family and have an honest conversation and, and have some of them say, you know, she really loved you. She was a good mom. And, you know, um, it, uh, it took a long time to reach that point, though, to have those conversations. And I started writing my memoir. I think about the time I started blogging. I don't. I don't have. I don't use that blog anymore. But once I realized that it was more than just my story, um, I started writing it down. And you know, I I put it away sometimes for for months or even a year. And then, but I always came back to it. And and now. Um, so, you know, I, I have a, several questions. I would, uh, of course, that's kind of jumping the gun, but I know that I, I'm anxious to find out what your relationship is like with your mom, like now and, and where it's going. But I also want to um, find out what was it like when you discovered, discovered that you're, you're not the only one? Well, right now, my relationship with my mother is, it's not great. Um, I wish, I, I so wish I could give this happy ending. Um, I think the happy part is that I came to realize what happened and, and wanted my mother in my life. Um, but it was, it was a difficult road to reconnection. And uh, we what are in touch now. What, what age were you? when you said you were in your 20s and stuff I, at what point did you reach out to her and um and was there you know um not to ask your age now but obviously you're oh. going to have a relationship with her sure i was 26 when i first reached out to her and you know i still lived near my the family i grew up with um one town away from my father my sisters, my stepmother. Uh, so I met up with my mother, heard her story, and it all makes sense to me because I, I feel like even as a child, my um, my intuition just sort of told me that she she hadn't just up and left. She wasn't this bad mother. She didn't want to abandon me, even though that was the storyline that I think I was expected to believe. Part of me never believed that. So when I heard her story, it validated what I felt like I knew all along, but couldn't ask anybody about um, growing up. So at that point, you know, I didn't really know what the answer was. I heard her story. I, um, I grieved. I finally grieved for the loss at that point. And then I sort of didn't know where to go from there. Um, and neither did she. And, you know, I think if there were adult alienated children listening, I, I, I think one of the things I would want to say is get some outside help for the reconnection if you get to that point, because it's not easy. And I think we were sort of dancing around each other and she was trying not to scare me away. And I took that as, well, she doesn't care enough. Maybe my father was right. And, and I almost wanted an excuse to say, okay, I heard your story and no hard feelings. Let's just go back to our own separate lives again. 
because that was the easy thing to do. Easy. That's interesting. Yeah. It's, it's not so confronting because then you don't have to make someone wrong. Um, yourself. And I had young children at that point. Um, you know, I, I was actually, when I first met up with her, I was pregnant with my second daughter and, and um, the reconnection at that time, it went on for a couple years, you know, on and off where we see each other and then we try email and um, it, in the whole time, it, uh, I'm almost ashamed to say this, but in my mind was, how will I tell my father? How will I tell my father if I'm resuming a relationship with her? Uh, because I knew it was just such a volatile subject and I didn't want, um, I, I sensed that, that, you know, my father and my sisters and my stepmother would completely reject me for the choice to reconnect with my mother. And, you know, yes, I was in my twenties, I was an adult, but think of how much wiser you are in your forties than in your twenties. You know, I still, I, I was still, um, grieving. I was still figuring things out. And, and I had a, I was a mother. Um, I didn't want my children to, I didn't want to ask my children to keep a secret. So I knew that they, you know, if I was open and honest with them that, you know, here's my mother that you, you're just now meeting and she's your grandmother, that that topic would come up in front of my father and his wife who considers herself my mother also. Um, and how, how, what would the reactions be? And, and, and then now my children are involved. And so it just, it got, it felt very complicated and difficult. And, and um, as much as I had the support of, you know, my husband, I, I wasn't working with a therapist at that time. I didn't really know how to navigate it in a healthy way and I, and I was scared. So how did your father react to it? Um, it? You know, it was a little while after that before I even brought the topic up to my father and he reacted um, kind of how you would expect if, if you, you know, knowing the ins and outs of parental alienation, um, in his mind, he, he was the victim. My mother um, wanted to leave the marriage. It was, you know, she was completely powerless in the marriage. It was a very, very rough marriage for her. And she wanted to escape it. Now this was back in 1970. And she had, you know, she did not, did not have a college education. She had um, no control over the finances. She had, although her parents were very loving grandparents to me, and we were very close, the, they were also, you know, had old fashioned values. And in their mind, she was married. She, she needed, she had children and she needed to stay married. And I don't think they un, uh, really knew the extent of what she was going through. So she really had no support to leave the marriage. She ended up having an affair. She thought that would be her way out. She would take us with her. And you know, that, that was going to be how she left the marriage um, and my father found out, threw her out of our home and, um, you know, that, that was the last time she lived with us. And so uh, now I'm forgetting the, where I was going with this, your last question. Well, I just, I'm curious because back in, what comes up for me is 1970, that's mm -hmm. not, equal shared parenting years. Right. Mom's got the kids. So how was it, was it because of the affair that he um, was able to win in court against her? Well, there really was no custody battle. And, and this was something I, you know, I wouldn't say held against my mother, but certainly my sister did for a while. It was, if she really loved us, why didn't she fight for us? So um, at the time, we were living in the home of my paternal grandparents. It was a two family home. So we were living upstairs from them. So it was my father's territory. When their marriage erupted and he you know, threw her out of our home, quite literally, 
out and um, he, the next morning, got a lawyer and, and it was called abandonment. He got temporary custody because she had, quote, abandoned us. So after that, um, there were some visitations before the court date to you know decide on custody. So the visitations were, um, my mother would come, to, would borrow somebody's car, come to our house to get us, and then bring us to her apartment where she now was, and, and then drop us off at the end of the visitation. And my sister and I would cling to her crying and my father would have to peel us off of her and he would say to her each time over and over, look what you're doing to them. This is too hard for them. Look what you're doing to them. Um, and, and of course, shaming her for the affair and, um, you know, in, her, in his mind, in his reality, she was the cause for the breakdown of the marriage and therefore he was the deserving parent. And I think she was so emotionally beaten down at that point. And she said she knew that she did not feel like she could fight him. And in fact, my paternal grandmother told me years and years later that before the court date, that never happened. My, my mother never went, never fought in court. Um, before that day, my father asked her to pack mine and my sister's bags because if he lost custody, he was taking us to Canada where he had family. Um, and so though part of me thought, wow, she should have really just fought. Um, I also think when she said your father wouldn't lose, she, you know, that's, that's not completely untrue. I mean, that's based on her, some realistic fears that she had. And now I hear from so many parents who, who do fight in court and, um, often to no avail. You know, I, I used to think if only she had fought in court and I don't know, maybe it would have worked. Maybe it wouldn't have. Do you, do you think that uh, the court system is better now than it was back then? Not necessarily. And, and I really, I don't have experience with it. So I really can't speak too much about the courts other than what I hear from other families and other parents going through it. But I, I'm not hearing a lot of success stories. I, I think perhaps part of the problem is um, judges are not educated on parental alienation. They don't recognize it. You know, if at four years old or five years old or really any age while I was still living with my father, if you had put me on the stand with him there and said, who do you want to be with? I would have said whatever he wanted me to say. Right. You know, when you, when a parent wants you to break contact with the other parent, that as a child, you become the emotional regulator. It's like this biological instinct where you have to do what that parent expects you to. You sense that, you know, I'll lose their love. They'll abandon me. It's just this, um, you know, our brains are wired to do what they expect us to do. And, and you, you can't speak up for yourself and your own needs at the same time as you're regulating the emotions of that parent. You can't do both. And I think 100% of the time, the child's going to choose to please that, that dominating parent that is sending that message that you better, you need to comply. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the safe parent is the sacrificial lamb. Mm-hmm. You know, they're the ones that, um, you know, you, um, whatever it takes, you know, um, you know, what I've seen over the course is there's certain things. I, yeah, you're right that a lot of these professionals who are uh, in dealing with these families going through custody battles, they don't have the basic education on understanding the dynamics that are hidden, like, and, and yet, they're pretty obvious. Like mm -hmm. children will protect their abusers. You mm -hmm. see it in dependency court 
over and over again with a child in foster care is clawing to get back to that parent who's just beaten them or starved them or whatever, but they, uh, they, they will do whatever it takes to get back to the child that's mistreated them or the parent that's mistreated them. Right. And, um, and it makes you wonder uh, how it is that, you know, in the school system, the mental health counselors, the legal profession, how they really don't get the dynamic. It's not, actually, it's not that complicated. It's very right. easy to see once it's been shown to you. Right. I, I think there's such a need for society to learn about this and in schools, like you said, teachers and, and even just uh, people who know other people going through it or, or who are divorced. I think it's so um, common for the, the aligned parent, you know, the, the person doing the alienating to come off as very convincing and very strong and um, and it's sort of a you're with me or you're against me attitude and people oftentimes don't want to question that um, no because they are the strong there when you're in the catbird seat when you are in the in the superior position in a custody battle you have you're not following falling apart of course not you are you're dominating this situation of course you're gonna have confidence and charisma and everything like that. And then the, the one who's being targeted um, might be suffering from post-traumatic stress and, and all that. And the untrained right. eye interprets it all together differently. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I get that. So, so what's your mission, your mission now? So you're, you um, uh, tell us from this point forward. I mean, what is it that you're wanting to accomplish to, to get the word out and who do you want to speak to? I want, um, you know, I would love for alienated children, adult alienated children to read my work as well as alienated parents and, and the, you know, the larger society. I think that, um, my story, you know, I, I didn't want it to just be, oh, here's my story of victimhood. There, there needs to be some redemption, um, some, you know, healing. And, and I think that's part of why it took me so long to write my memoirs because I needed to go through the whole process, you know, which took decades really to um, feel the closure, to, figure out how do you completely heal from something like this, even if, whether or not you reconnect with your parent and whether or not the alienating parent ever admits what they did, which most of the time will be no. And um, so I, I feel like my story speaks to not just people who have gone through parental alienation, but perhaps people who have gone through childhood trauma or some um, abuse of power and um, you know, how do you, how do you heal from that? How do you um, get back to, or sort of like reclaim your, you know, your authentic self. And because when you go through something like that as a child, you, you have to suppress some, you know, I had to suppress my love for my mother, I suppressed that bond. And, and then I spent some of my adult life figuring out, well, how do I get back to that? How, you know, I wanted the memories, um, the good and the bad. I wanted to um, really face it head on. And um, so I can't through, I can tell my story. I can never say this is what you can do to get your child back. This is what you have to do if you were an alienated child, because, you know, every story is, although there are some certain common elements, every story is unique. And as a writer, I can just tell my story and hope that it's helpful, hope that it spreads awareness. I can't give legal advice. I can't give, you know, I'm not a psychologist, 
but I can tell my story in, in hope that um, alienated children maybe would read it or hear it and think, oh, that happened to me. Um, parents might read it and think, oh, that's how it felt, felt for my child. Maybe a different approach would be better. Um, society might, you know, hopefully somebody with no experience with alienation in their immediate family might read my story and think, oh, you know, that friend who was bad mouthing her husband or, or wife or whatever, maybe it's not fair that I'm only hearing one side of the story. Yeah. So really just all I can do is, I think, tell my story and, and spread awareness. Did it, I, we just have a couple more minutes. I did, but I did have a question. Has what you've gone through, how has it impacted you as an adult being a mother and a wife? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I've sort of always known I would be a mother. I always wanted to be, um, I'm happy nurturing other people. It's just part of who I am. So I, I always loved motherhood. I, um, you know, had the good fortune of marrying a wonderful man. We have three grown children together. And it, this was sort of, um, it, I, it certainly perhaps made me appreciate motherhood because I couldn't, I missed out on that bond with my mother that I really was robbed of that should, that I should have had, but I got to have it as the mother. So um, I, I always, I think have really appreciated that. And, but, you know, I, I've always felt like um, a lot of people have childhood wounds and, and it's best if we face them, you know, whether it's before we have children, we have children already. I think it's perhaps a good example to kids to um, not run away from the hard things. Yeah. And I certainly did not do it perfectly. I, I have some regrets about the way I went about it for sure. Uh, but. Well, good. Well, you know, I, I really appreciate you taking time to be uh, to share with our viewers uh, from the perspective of a child who went through alienation and came out of it, um, you know, with just trying to make sense of it all. And, um, you know, that's the only way that things are going to change. And to, you know, really, like you said, people can hear your story and say, wow, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. um, and get them inquiring about this. And otherwise it becomes, for my experience, if things don't change, then the cycle repeats. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Dana. Um, and I look forward to reading your full memoir when it, when it comes out. And right. hopefully we'll connect again real soon. I hope so, thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us for Custody Matters Live tonight. I look forward to talk, seeing you again next week. Take care.